Welcome to this DW Business Special, asking who have sanctions against Russia hit hardest? Almost as soon as Russia's military rolled onto Ukrainian soil, Western allies began their own assault. They initiated a sanctions regime that has now targeted Russia's banking sector, its aviation industry, its energy exports, and its oligarchs. But from the outset, Moscow has said it would only backfire. Were they right? Who are the sanctions hurting the most? Well, to answer those questions and plenty more, I'm joined by Alina Rybakova, Deputy Chief Economist at the Institute of International Finance. Thanks a lot for joining us, Alina. Thank you so much for having me. So to understand who the sanctions are hurting the most, we need an idea of their impact on Russia and also their impact on the West. So is Russia suffering under these sanctions, Alina? Russia is definitely suffering under the sanctions. And I really like your question, who is suffering the most? Well, Russia's most progressive integrated into the global economy, parts of the Russian industry are suffering the most. You know, with Russia made a lot of progress since the 90s. We'll remember, you know, integration into the global value chains limited, it may be. However, it's exactly those industries that are being hurt by the sanctions. And also, we should not forget that common people are suffering from sanctions as well. And it's not because the, the West, the evil West, is imposing sanctions on common people. It's because the authorities of Russia have decided to reorient all of their spending and efforts towards the war machine and insulation and isolation from the global economy. And therefore, the common people already have been paying the price since the 2014. So that's it. Russia is growing increasingly isolated. Elena, just stay with us because I just want to play something. The US and the EU, you know, are very swift to turn to sanctions as a tool to punish Russia for its invasion of Ukraine in February. But from the outset, the message from the Kremlin has been that the West would come out worse than the Russians. We can now confidently declare that their policies with respect to Russia have failed. The strategy of economic blitzkrieg has proven unsuccessful and the sanctions have scored an own goal for their initiators. The rejection of Russian energy resources means that systemically in the long term Europe will become the region with the highest cost of energy resources in the world. Such economic self-harm or suicide is of course a domestic matter for the European countries. So Alina Rybakova, he described it as an own goal or an act of self-harm, the, the, the sanctions. Have they proven to be as such for Europe and the United States in particular? Well, I think the act of self-harm clearly has been on behalf of Russia. We were expecting growth more than 3% this year. There was a very strong recovery last year of more than 4% for Russia. However, there is nobody who is forecasting positive growth for Russia this year or next year. What is more worrisome is the potential growth. And you think about it simplistically, whether it's labor supply, capital, stock productivity, data and digital economy. I cannot put a plus on any of those components. So we expect even medium term potential growth. If I could, as an economist, put a negative number, I would put a negative number on that. And it's hard to dispute it. Um, in terms of the impact of Europe, of course, Europe, as it moved towards sort of reducing domestic energy production, it became more reliant on Russia, on more than 40 percent of energy imports, depending on the component. However, it's also very healthy for Europe to diversify the sources of their strategic energy supplies, and that's what's happening. Also, let's not forget the beginning of the year, the forecast of doomsday scenarios, including for Germany, that should have produced double-digit contraction in the economy, and we're not seeing that. The economy is standing uh, we have seen some reductions, but we've also seen incredible signs of substitution in Germany and other countries away from Russian energy. The aim of the sanctions wasn't just, I suppose, to punish Russia, but was also to squeeze its ability to pay for the war and hopefully bring it to an early end. But it does appear that that hasn't been successful so far, that Russia hasn't been running out of the money it needs to continue its assault on Ukraine. Well, I think that is linked partially to unrealistic expectations. And we flagged it also a few years back that Russia has pursued fortress Russia strategy since 2014. And although some analysts laughed about it, well, it has proven at least partially accurate. 
you know, they have introduced inflation targeting, cleaned up the banking system, introduced fiscal policy rule, where they saved extra budgetary revenues with oil over $40 per barrel. So this extra monies they were saving in the National Wellbeing Fund. So they were preparing, maybe nobody knew for this specific war, but they were insulating and isolating the economy since 2014. Therefore, sanctions is not like flipping a switch and suddenly Russia disintegrates. No, it's a long-term strategy that needs to be adjusted and also carefully implemented. So, um, if, for example, we've seen contraction in imports uh, to, from, by Russia in the beginning, including from some of the strategic imports. But now we're seeing signs that these imports are still reaching Russia, but via other countries. So we need to double down on the implementation of some of the measures that we have announced. And there have been more measures coming and more sanctions coming. By the day, they seem to be being announced. The US has just sanctioned one of Russia's uh, richest men. Uh, more sanctions coming there, more coming from the EU. We'll talk about the impact they're having uh, on the economy, obviously in Russia, but also on the European and uh, US economies. And one of the ways to measure the health of an economy is to look at the value of its currency. So let's just see how Russia's ruble and the euro have fared since the invasion of Ukraine back in February. Let's begin with the Russian currency. Uh, with these graphs, remember that low is basically a good thing. And you can see here that in the months after the invasion, the number of rubles to the dollar actually fell. Recently, it's been lingering around the 60 to the dollar mark, and the ruble is arguably in better shape than it was in before the war. But let's also take a look now at the euro and how that's been doing. It's had a noticeably tougher time of it. At one point, it actually hit parity with the dollar, something that hadn't happened since the very early days of the single currency. However, it's recovered somewhat since that point. How much can we read into the apparent resilience of the ruble in, in the face of these sanctions? Well, as one of the sort of insiders said, there is nobody has done more damage to the Russian budget than the governor of the central bank. And I'll explain it now. Uh, most, a big chunk of revenues, 40% of Russian federal budget revenues come from oil and gas exports. So the companies export, get dollars or euros back in return. They convert them into rubles and then pay their taxes to the Russian budget. So what happens when the ruble goes from 150 to 65? Budget loses trillions of rubles and revenues. So it's not, as, a, as you can see, it's not a one-way street saying, well, strong currency is great and, and weak currency is not. For Russian central bank, and the, particularly the Ministry of Finance, strong ruble is a big problem at the moment. They would love to see it weaker. Unfortunately, it's hard when you have pretty much blocked your financial account. You prevent people from withdrawing money from the country, foreign investors. And at the same time, you're having a large current account surplus. Basically, the trade balance is in large surplus. So that brings me to the second point. On the, on the trade balance, we talk a lot about sanctions. Russia is the most sanctioned economy now in the world. But let's not forget, until 5th of December, we have not yet touched the crown jewel. We haven't touched the exports of energy and gas. And I think that's why, for now, Russia enjoyed large foreign exchange inflows. It will continue to change next year. For Europe, it's definitely a nuanced picture. Europe relied for many years on relatively cheaper energy supplies from Russia. And, of course, also pursuing multiple objectives, of course, very important ones. Green Deal is a very important objective. But it also meant that some of the strategic suppliers to Europe felt that they would like to switch to short-term energy contracts with Russia, which well, was Europe, sorry, which are of course much more volatile. So Europe needs to reassess its strategic objectives and priorities. But also, finally, let us not forget that sanctions is one way, but at the same time, we're having war basically on the territory of Europe, and other countries are potentially also at risk of Russian aggression. So physical war versus some pain from sanctions. This is the cost-benefit analysis we need to make. And just to go back to the, the currency question and talk about the euro a little bit, how much has the behaviour of the euro been dictated by um, European sanctions against Russia and how much of it is actually just down to the, you know, the war itself? Well, I think it's, uh, it's important to say that for Europe, gas prices are very important. For the US, you know, to simplify somewhat, oil prices are more important. So therefore, as we had concerns of skyrocketing, skyrocketing gas prices, I'm sorry, even before the war, of course, there were concerns about European competitiveness, European economy, and also the fact that uh, commodity prices are get paid in dollar. So I think that had an impact on euro-dollar relationship. 
Of course, now as the situation is stabilizing, we see Europe uh, holding up somewhat better. Of course, that is again impacting um, Euro-Dollar relationship. When Europe is, Euro is weaker rather than other country, country, countries' uh, currencies, of course, it hurts us on the inflation front because there is a path through to inflation. But at the same time, it makes European exports somewhat uh, more attractive. So as the global economy begins to stabilize, including China, we could actually potentially benefit from weaker euro rather than not. OK, Alina, I just want to move on to something that's tangentially attached to, to, to the, the currency question, and that's inflation. And inflation has been a word closely associated with the Russian war in Ukraine. So let's look at how rising costs have played out in Russia as compared to the West. Well, in Russia, inflation nearly doubled in the early months of the war, having already been at 9.2%, so a high level. It's still above pre-war levels now. In the Eurozone, inflation has been lower, but steadily rising since February. It hit double digits in October and November, but it is showing signs of slowing. And in the US, you can see here, inflation has been hovering between 7 and 9%, with a bit of a cool-off recently. So when it comes to inflation, so Elena, yeah, has, 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 I mean, has the war made a, a bad situation for Russia worse? I think the war made the bad situation for Russia definitely worse, but of course also for the global economy it definitely made the situation worse. Um, sort of to put it in a bigger context, emerging markets started getting worried about inflation on the back of return from COVID, right? That's where the origins of inflation come from. Um, the emerging markets were more worried about uh, inflation expectations, including the Central Bank of Russia, and as you know, started hiking much before this time around than the Fed or the ECB. At the same time, the Fed and the ECB felt that some of the shocks, so some people in these institutions felt that the shocks are transitory, you know, this is just a supply shock, and therefore we could look through it. However, as they increasingly realized that inflation expectations are getting at the, at the risk of unanchoring, of course, we saw decisive action by the Fed and the ECB. So, yes, the war made already a difficult situation of coming out of COVID harder because it was an additional unexpected supply shock on the energy front. Well, EU leaders remain committed to intensifying their sanctions against Russia, don't they, Elena? I just want to play uh, a clip, because as long as the war continues, these sanctions are going to keep on coming, according to the EU. And after the EU announced its latest measures this week, Olaf Scholz, the chancellor here in Germany, said it was in the Russian president's power to end the pain back home. With his war, Putin is not only destroying the infrastructure, the cities, and villages of Ukraine. He is not only destroying an incredible number of human lives, and he has not only put the lives of many of his own soldiers at risk. Because that is also part of the truth, that countless people have died for this imperialist attempt to take over part of his neighbor's territory. But actually, he is also destroying Russia's future with this war. And that is what he has to justify to his own country and his own people whose future he is damaging in this way. Meanwhile, in the face of yet more sanctions against in his regime, uh, here's what President Putin had to say this week. Despite the sanctions, over the first nine months of this year, deliveries of basic goods from Russia to the EU countries increased one and a half times. Joint Russian exports increased by 42 percent, while the trade surplus increased in our favor by 2.3 times to $138 billion. In essence, the European Union continues to consume our goods and services, while holding back the reverse flows. The situation concerning these imbalances cannot continue indefinitely. So what do we do? We will look for other more promising partners in actively growing regions of the world economy, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa. The markets belonging to friendly countries will be where we will reorientate Russian energy supplies. Already over the first nine months of this year, oil exports to partner countries increased by almost a quarter. Elena Rybakova, Vladimir Putin, with plenty to say there, but he's using this line about how, you know, as well as shooting themselves in the foot, he's saying that the European nations are still 
but you know, helping to fund Russia with uh, with their purchases of oil and gas. Although obviously there are limits on those now. Uh, is there any truth in what he's saying there? Or is it all propaganda? Well, the fact that we didn't touch immediately the sort of the crown jewel oil and gas, I think that means that you know European Union needed time to gather domestic support and also prepare the economy for the spillovers, you know, the, or rather the spillbacks from the sanctions effect, exactly what we're discussing now. So I think the governments needed time to prepare their population and also measures that they can do to alleviate the effect of the sanctions. So yes, in that sense, you know, it's accurate that the current account is huge because uh, European countries and, and many others continue to buy Russian oil, which is no longer will be the case from the 5th of December. And another important point, I think, to make here is that um, it's not only Europe and, and U.S. are suffering. You know, in many countries, for example, in Africa, there's been starvation already before. And now Putin, with this uh, failed uh, grain deals and sort of trying to blame the West and the sanctions rather than the war on Ukraine, which is a very important supply of global grain and other food products, is making an impact not just on Europe and the U.S., but also the most sort of the weaker frontier economies, especially the vulnerable population there. And then finally, if the war is going so well for Putin, why is it that he is more than doubling spending on their domestic security? So within the current budget, the largest increase is happening in the domestic security. Basically, it is AMON or special forces to prevent Russian people from rising and potentially changing the government. So, at, you know, I'm not a political analyst, so I'm not sure, I do not know how likely it is to happen. But all I can say that in the budget, people are worried and they're putting extra money there. It's not environmental protection, which is getting cut. It's not social spending, which is standing flat and has been cut since 2014. It is domestic security and defense of the Russian government. Yeah, so there does seem to be some nerves about what's to come for, for the Kremlin. And let's actually talk about uh, the future. So we've had signs this week, particularly from the actions of, as you mentioned, the Federal Reserve and the European Central Bank, taking a bit of a step back with their rates increases, increasing by a little less than they have been doing in the past. Inflation seems to be stabilising, if not going down, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. Are the effects of the sanctions that the West have imposed on Russia diminishing as we get further and further away from the, the moment when those sanctions were imposed and actually taking less of a toll on the countries that imposed them? I think it's the combination of the fact, as we talked about, sort of the post-COVID recovery, the central banks in the, the merged, in developed markets, the Fed and ECB, I would say, being somewhat behind the curve when they started. And then on top of that, the effect of sanctions. I think all of these effects are diminishing and we should see stabilization and inflation and also coming off, partially, of course, because of the base effects. So the after decisive actions of the Fed and the ECB early on, now they actually have a bit more space to be a bit more patient. So, I, yes, the effect of the sanctions is diminishing somewhat, but also other effects like being behind the curve and also the post-COVID recovery and the effect on inflation. OK, and as for Russia, is uh, the worst of the sanctions still to come for them? Is there more pain down the road? Are they, they, they yet to really bite? I think the pain is going to be continuous. You know, we've seen immediate impact. And I have to say, I do not believe all of the Russian statistics. For example, this year, they're reporting double-digit investment growth. Of course, supposedly government did double-digit investment. The state-controlled companies did double-digit investment. I find it very hard to believe those, some of those numbers. Nonetheless, the impact will continue to be medium term. At the same time, as Russia finds new creative ways to circumvent sanctions, we need to have to be aware that this is almost like a game of whack-a-mole. We need to keep coming after different actors, whether it's third countries that are not directly involved in sanctions, and find also creative ways that will help the industry, not only just the financial industry, but the insurance industry, the shipping industry, to comply with the sanctions. And there, again, what we started talking about is the implementation um, is the key at the moment. OK, I think that's a good place to leave it, just looking ahead at how, what 2023 is perhaps going to look like. So I will say thank you very much, Elena Rybakova, Deputy Chief Economist at the Institute of International Finance, for joining us on this DW Business Special. Thank you so much for having me. And if you've enjoyed watching this, wherever you are watching it, there's plenty more from DW Business here on the DW News YouTube channel. Until next time, take care.